and in behalf of all committee members and my own, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Willig. Uh, he got his PhD degree from the University of Pittsburgh and currently he is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology as well as the founding director of the Center of Environmental Sciences and Engineering at the University of Connecticut. Uh, Dr. Willie was a long-term member of the faculty in the Department of Biological Sciences at Texas Tech, where he was a chairman of the department as well as director of the Institute of Environmental Studies. Uh, in addition, he has served the National Science Foundation in two capacities, as a program director in ecology and division director of environmental biology. <clears throat> uh, he has conducted extensive research in Latin America uh, like in places like Brazil, Paraguay, and Peru, and uh, was funding collaborator and current uh, co-PI in the NSC-funded Luquillo Mountains Ecological Research Program in Puerto Rico. Uh, the conceptual thrust of his research include gradients of diversity and uh, range size, productivity diversity relationships, particularly uh, their scale dependence, biogeography and macroecology of island faunas, conservation reserve design at uh, broad spatial scales, effects of reduced impact logging in, in population and communities in the Amazon, disturbance ecology, especially in the hurricane prone uh, Caribbean, and meta-community ecology. Uh, Dr. Willig is the author and co-author of about 195 scholarly uh, publications and books, and has enjoyed over $20 million in grant support from federal agencies. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Willie. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, first, I'm really honored to have been selected by the graduate students to be a participant in today's symposium. Uh, it really is a very special feeling to know that you've been selected by the future of the discipline that you represent. And then secondly, I think I'm really humbled to be here uh, from two perspectives. First, to be sort of on this podium collectively with the other four members of the symposium crew today and also by the legacy of all the previous people who have been here. So it's sort of a heavy responsibility to, to speak in front of you with that kind of um, history to confront. Um, as you can see today, what I'm going to talk about are elevational gradients from the perspective of populations, communities, and meta-communities. And I kind of wanted to have something cool and witty to say at the beginning of the talk, and, and I can't do that. But, but instead, I, I thought I'd focus on this sort of concept of serendipity. Because when I looked at this talk, I realized that about 40 years ago, when I was a graduate student, I proposed in my dissertation to look at that community organization along elevational gradients in northeastern Brazil. And never having been out of the country, around 1976, flew to northeastern Brazil and looked out at the panorama, and it kind of looked like West Texas. I think you know what I mean, flat. There were really very few elevational gradients that could be looked at. And that naivete of, of trying to have a theoretical construct to work in a place that you'd never been before was a challenge. But in any case, uh, I stayed. I worked on back community organization in two different habitats. And then about 35 years ago, about five years after completing my dissertation, I went to Puerto Rico, armed with this knowledge of bats, now to try to understand foraging ecology of bats. And uh, I went there and netted bats week after week after week after week to discover that the abundance of bats in the Lequeo Experimental Forest is very, very low. And after thousands and thousands of net hours, didn't have enough bats to conduct the research, but every night I would go out and check my nets and see hundreds of walking sticks and think, I'm not gonna lose a summer of research simply because I can't catch any bats. So I did a mark recapture study of walking sticks and went back to Puerto Rico the next year and actually did the foraging ecology experiments on walking sticks rather than on bats. And was even more impressed by the abundance of snails in the same places where I found <laughs> walking sticks. So the thread of my research has been do it at night because walking sticks are out, snails are out, and bats are out. But serendipity plays a really big role in our life. And I find it ironic that I come here today, I'm gonna to talk about the topic that was to be the focus of my dissertation, 
on the fauna that I wasn't prepared to study on, which would have been gastropods, but hopefully you'll find the mother ramblings after this to be at least as entertaining and perhaps more informative than what I've had to say so far. So biodiversity gradients are a, a major focus in, in ecology and biogeography, macroecology and evolution. Uh, we're really interested in patterns, the mechanisms that cause them and the consequences that arise from them. And there are basically two kinds of gradients, spatial gradients and environmental gradients, and of course those two things are intricately linked. And one of the challenges of contemporary ecology is to decouple the effects of space from the effect of the environment. And that's a, a pretty big challenge when it comes to elevation because it's a one-dimensional direction, one gradient from the bottom to the top of mountains. So it's very hard to pull those two things apart. But historically, as some of the speakers before me, like Gary, have talked about and Bruce, is there's lots of gradients of biodiversity that people have focused on. Some of them are spatial, some of them are environmental, some of them are both. And what I'm going to focus on today is environmental gradients that relate to elevation. Uh, one of the first things is, you know, bio, a bioclimatic law that as you go up in elevation, you have changes in abiotic conditions such as temperature, which, which actually um, recapitulate the same kinds of patterns you see with latitude that at least initially in the 60s really motivated a lot of people to try to study one gradient or the other because they thought they informed each other. But there's some very dramatic changes in temperature that accompany rises in elevation that are associated with uh, heat loss with, uh, with currents rising as you run into mountains. Uh, there are also very distinct forest zones that also often accompany that in terms of the plant responses to those abiotic conditions. Uh, one advantage of studying ele uh, latitude and elevational gradients rather than latitudinal gradients is that you can simplify the system a lot. You don't have to worry so much about multiple historical contingencies that affect the outcomes, let's say, at, at zero degrees latitude versus 35 degrees latitude. Or if you're studying an island archipelago where the islands close to Venezuela and the Caribbean have a different source of colonists than do islands in the Bahamas that perhaps have their major source of colonization from North America, or let's say those more from the, the middle of, let's say, from the, um, um, uh, the central part of the, of the Caribbean, uh, let's see, or Puerto Rico and some of the associated smaller islands where they actually may be coming from Merida and associated areas in, in, in that part of Mexico. So you don't have multiple species poles to think about and how those multiple species poles may affect variation in the abundance and distribution of organisms. And then finally, also if you're doing these broad scale studies, systematic resolution is a challenge to understand and have the same degree of systematic expertise and res res resolution along a large gradient is very difficult, whereas it's an easier task to accomplish if you're in a small focused area where a number of experts can potentially understand the fauna or the flora to a large extent. So there's lots of practical reasons to study um, elevational gradients, and there's a lot of hope that by studying elevational gradients we can start understand other kinds of gradients that have parallel abiotic or biotic conditions that uh, change in tandem with them. The conceptual model that I hope to explore in today's talk, or the one that motivated the research that I'll talk about today, which is really on animal biodiversity, was to distinguish uh, how abiotic gradients associated with changes in elevation might affect animal populations. And that they can affect animal populations, communities, and metacommunities in one of two general ways. They can directly do it by affecting abiotic or climatic characteristics, which may affect the fundamental niches of organisms, or at least those characteristics affect the likelihood that species will occur that are based upon their fundamental niches. Or indirectly, these abiotic gradients could influence animal populations, communities, and metacommunities by affecting plant composition and physiognomy. So, in general, then, what I hope to do today is to use this, this um, infrastructure provided by elevational gradients to try to decouple sort of biotic and abiotic effects on animal communities versus how those effects are mediated by plant communities. And as an outline of the activities that I'll do today, I offer the following. I'll begin with an outline of the study area, followed by studies of sort of classical features of biodiversity, uh, population abundance, things at the population level, versus community level attributes like diversity, evenness, dominance, rarity, whatever. And then finally conclude uh, with the consideration of metacommunities and how these same gradients play a role in structuring metacommunities along elevational gradients. So, the Caribbean is a hot spot of biodiversity. In Puerto Rico, lies as a fulcrum within the, uh, between the greater and lesser Antilles with floral and faunal elements of both. Um, so as you can see here that, that uh, within Puerto Rico, we have the Luquillo Experimental Forest, 
arguably one of the oldest protected areas in the New World, established as a, by Edict of the King of Spain when Fort Puerto Rico was Spanish. And it's essentially been protected since that time to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, we're also fortunate that within the Luquillo Experimental Force, we've had a long-term ecological research program funded by the National Science Foundation. I think it's 25 years or so of uh, research that's been done there. So a big focus of at least my work in Puerto Rico is to try to understand long-term spatiotemporal dynamics in animal populations and communities, and more recently, metacommunities. Uh, another interesting thing about Puerto Rico in particular, and the Caribbean in general, is these systems are hurricane mediated. And I think all of us along at least the eastern coast of the United States are becoming more and more aware of this as the frequency and intensity of tropical storms uh, are having larger and larger impacts on our day-to-day -day lives. But Puerto Rico is particularly prone to uh, having direct hits from hurricanes. I think the historical average is uh, a hurricane comes by and hits some part of the island every 30 to 40 years. Uh, interestingly, when I first started working in Puerto Rico, there hadn't been a hurricane in something like 40 years. And so our view of that forest was a forest that had fully recovered from hurricanes and was really a, a patch dynamic system where tree falls were the major disturbances and heterogeneity within the forest was a consequence of um, sort of this typical aging of the forest and the falling of trees. And then right after the, the LTR program got funded in 1988, Hurricane Hugo came by and before all the pre uh, analyses could be accomplished. Uh, we had major devastation of the forest, uh, and you'll get a feeling for that by looking at this particular slide. Uh, in, the, in the top uh, is an image of the, the Lukio experimental forest right after Hurricane Hugo. It hardly looks like a forest at all. It looks like um, a field right before slash and burn agriculture is going to be practiced. And then the rate at which secondary succession operates is illustrated in the next slide above it, below it where five years after the hurricane, you can see things have greened up considerably. And if you go out 15 years after the hurricane, uh, you'll find that it's actually hard to distinguish uh, that forest from what it looked like before. I don't know if that, that's a testimony either to the recovery of the forest or the shortness of our memories. But in either case, many of the features of the forest have recovered quite quickly. And of course, that might be expected in a system that over hundreds of years has been subject, uh, subjected to recurrent hurricanes. And so those adaptive features would be expected in such floors and faunas. But as a consequence of hurricane-mediated disturbances and other kinds of disturbances, such as at low elevations, we have the encroachment of human activities. Human land use is, is um, progressing at a very, very rapid rate uh, in the lowlands of Puerto Rico, and it's beginning to reach up into the mid-elevations as well. So you have disturbance coming at the lower elevations, changing the source sink dynamics of populations and communities within these areas. And of course, the threat of climate change is also altering what we think might be happening in, uh, at higher elevations as some of those uh, cloud forest communities may become lost as uh, cloud condensation points rises as a consequence of uh, global change scenarios or the combination of global change scenarios and heat islands created by uh, burgeoning suburbanization and urbanization of tropical systems. Our general understanding of such systems, you need to know two things to understand what's happening at any one place. You have to understand the characteristics of that place, the, the characterization of geographic space based upon ecological characteristics so that you can understand how the fundamental niches of organisms match onto the biophysical characteristics of the site. But that's not enough. You also have to understand the landscape within which that site is mediated because that will affect the, the operation of, for example, source six dynamics, the movement of individuals between patches of equal quality, the movement of individuals out of patches as they undergo secondary succession. And so it's a really disturbance mediated systems like the ones in Puerto Rico really require this broad understanding of um, how various features affect the dispersal of individuals and the consequences of that to the characteristics of any particular site that we find on a landscape. So, uh, Puerto Rico is, is, is the jewel of the Caribbean. Uh, and you can find within about seven kilometers from the coast of Puerto Rico to the peaks of uh, El Yunque, uh, changes of about 1,400 meters of elevation. And attendant with that elevational variation is the existence of three classically defined forest types, Tabanuco, Palo Colorado, and Elfin Forest. Uh, these characteristics have been, these distinctions have been established by characteristics that include species composition, but also species physiognomy. Uh, the higher parts of um, cloud forests, which are called elfin forests, or in addition uh, to being sort of covered in mist and, and precipitation, they're also subjected to very strong winds. 
And th those two things in tandem result in sort of gnarled physiognomies of the trees, very sclerophyllous leaves, uh, a very low forest type. But we at least have these three classically defined forest types. And if you go into any reasonably large elevational uh, relief kinds of situations, especially in tropical mines, you'll see three or more forest types uh, going up. If you go to the Andes, there might be six or seven, depending upon the classifications that you use. And so this fortunately represents a nice natural experiment that we can exploit to try to understand how environmental variation that's correlated with elevation uh, can affect the abundance and distribution of animal species. So. Uh, we established two parallel transects within a, particular, one, a single watershed within the Lukiwa Experimental Forest. Um, one transect passed through those three distinct forest types that I talked about, uh, Tabanuco, Palo Colorado, and Elfin Forest. And we took advantage of a fourth forest type that I actually should have mentioned to you in the earlier slide, which is called Palm Forest. Palm Forest occurs um, at all elevations in the Lukiwa Mountains. It's highly associated with uh, steep slopes with well-drained soils. And so that forest type, palm forest, is, it's not really a monoculture, it's probably 80 to 90% of the trees, or at least the biomass that you'll find within a site will be a single species of tree. Uh, Prestoea montana used to be its name, I've forgotten now what its new name is, I think it, it doesn't matter, Prestoea montana is good enough. Uh, and, and it'll occur at all elevations, and it occurs as patches in dendritic form. So you can find palm forest patches adjacent to mixed forest patches, which is kind of cool because now you can hope that the abiotic characteristics and the climatic characteristics that change with elevation will change for both forest types or from an animal perspective, but that the biotic community that's based on plants will change the zones within the mixed forest transect, but there will be a single forest type along the palm forest transect. So we have an opportunity to decouple elevational variation per se from elevational variation associated with distinct uh, vegetative zones and their effects on animal populations, communities, and metacommunities. So here's a diagram of the uh, part of the Lequeo Experimental Forest showing the, uh, the sites that we had going up the elevational gradient. Uh, so within the mixed forest, can people hear me? I know as I move away to look, the, my voice seems to get very quiet at this end. Is it? Can you all hear me in the back? Good. Uh, Within the mixed forest, we had 15 strata every 50 meters from 300 to 1,000 meters. And palm forest, we essentially had the same design, except there were no palm patches at 750 meters, so we don't have a perfectly balanced design as we go up in elevation, but it's pretty close. Uh, and it's important to notice that all of these paired sites were no further than uh, 150 meters apart, so they're all very, very close. And uh, because of the irregular configuration of palm forest, uh, it had a different configuration of plots in it than did mixed forest transects because within a mixed forest stratum, we could, in a rectilinear fashion, have 10 plots organized in a two by five sort of matrix approach. Whereas we couldn't do that because of the shape of palm forest, but they were always contiguous and the average distance between sites didn't exceed the maximum distance between sites in, uh, by definition actually, uh, in mixed forest given those different configurations. And each of our plots was actually a circle with three meter radius. Uh, so given that as the sort of the, the overall experimental design in terms of how things were sampled, I want to go a little bit and talk about uh, gastropods. Uh, gastropods are actually very cool organisms when you take the time to look at them. Uh, I didn't think I would be very enthused working on gastropods because bats are super cool, but uh, gastropods have their own allure as well. Uh, and, part, and, and again, it's a, they're locally abundant in the Lukiu Experimental Forest. Uh, they're reasonably rich. There's about 44 species of gastropod in the Lukiu Experimental Forest. Uh, many of them, however, do not occur uh, within the Sonodora watershed, and many of them are uh, very tiny and they're sort of microgastropods rather than um, macrogastropods. And what we're going to be studying are the macrogastropods. Um, previous work in the Lukiu Experimental Forest suggests that they're functionally important because of the role in uh, uh, decomposition. Uh, we also recognize that they respond to disturbances, tree falls, uh, anthropogenic activities, uh, for, for example, forestry practices, coffee plantation, uh, all have impacts on biodiversity of gastropods. They respond to um, uh, hurricanes quite dramatically, and they recover quite quickly from hurricane disturbances. 
Uh, so there's lots of, and we know a lot about the gastropods because we've been studying them for 20 odd years in the, in the forest. So they were kind of a cool system or a, at least a model system from my perspective, or it was the system that I knew that I could use to study these elevational gradients. Uh, and, and along the two transects, we, we captured actually 16 gastropods. Uh, there was only one, well, there were 14 species on each transect. One was unique to each transect, the other 14 were shared. So they were essentially uh, the same faunas. Uh, and the, the results that I'll talk about today derive from uh, surveys during the wet season of 2008, where we would have three surveys um, of each plot. Uh, each survey endured somewhere between 8 o'clock at night to 4 o'clock in the morning, where there were three or more individuals that, that were uh, non-destructively sampling everything from the level of the litter of the soil or rocks, depending on what the substrate was, up to um, 9 feet in height. And because we, some of these snails are reasonably small, uh, we couldn't really execute mark recapture studies on many of them without actually destroying the individual snails, at least with the technology available to us and the budgets available to us. Uh, so we basically uh, quantified relative abundance based upon minimum number known alive, which is the maximum number that you capture of any one species during any one of the three time periods. Uh, work at another site in the Tabanugo Forest suggests that uh, variation in minimum number known alive is highly correlated to, to mar various mark recapture estimates that we could do for the larger two species of snails that we have there. So we feel reasonably confident that, at least as a relative measure, this is at least a first jab at trying to understand um, how abundance changes with elevation and or how abundance informs biodiversity studies. So what I'll first start with then is looking at the responses of populations of gastropods uh, to elevation and to the differences between transects. So there's two factors, elevation and transect. Elevation, 50, 100 meters, 150 meters, 200 meters, and then transect, the mixed forest transect versus the palm forest transect. And of course, this is a replicated factorial design, so we also have the capacity to look at the interaction between transect and forest. So this is important because, for example, if the three different plant communities have no effect on gastropods, then you might expect that any elevational gradients will be parallel or coincident between the, the two transects. They'll be replicates of each other, essentially. Uh, alternatively, totally, there could be step functions with, of changes in abundance, so within Tabanuco Forest, within Palo Colorado Forest, within Dwarf Forest, or stairwell steps down, going downward if there's those kinds of responses or not. So we have a nice system to be able to distinguish those kinds of effects. And I'll take a minute to explain this uh, colorful figure. Uh, so it clearly identifies all three of the factors that are being examined transect, that is palm versus non-palm forest, elevation and interaction. These were the species whose abundances and frequencies of occurrence were sufficient to warrant statistical analysis. Uh, the sign after the species tells you what the empirical estimate is of the slope of how abundance changes with elevation. What you'll notice is that all but one species decreases in abundance empirically as you increase in elevation. Notice that all but one species showed a significant change with elevation, but I need to spend a little bit more time explaining this diagram to you. Notice that all but one species had an effect of elevation, either consistent effects or interactive effects, so all species that had sufficiently large samples did change with elevation, except for Oleocinia playa. Transect effects, that is differences between the two mixed, the mixed forest and the palm forest plots, were evinced by all but um, two species, right? These two showed interactions, these four plus this one showed a transect effect. So we had both consistent effects along the transects or interactions between the effects of elevation and transect. Um, and so what we see is a very strong parallel change in most, if not all, species of gastropods along the elevational gradient where gastropods decrease in abundance as you go up in elevation, and they do so in parallel fashion along most of the transects except for two where we have the interaction between transect and elevation. And I should point out that even in those cases, the lines do not intersect within the domain of study. So what that really means is the rate of decrease in abundance is steeper along one transect than another, but they never reverse themselves. Snails don't get to be more abundant in one transect than another. And rather than show you all nine of these slides, I'll just show you one slide for total abundance, because actually it's the most complicated slide, but it illustrates the general phenomenon. <laughs> 
And this will also be the same format I use when I try to illustrate how aspects of biodiversity change along the elevational gradient. So I'll take a moment to try to um, explain what the, what, the, what the graphic represents. So the dependent variable is always on the y-axis, obviously. Elevation is always on the x-axis. Uh, the dashed lines and the open symbols represent characteristics for plots in palm forest. The solid lines and the filled-in symbols represent variation along the mixed forest transect. And the three different colors represent the elevational ranges associated with the three forest types, where green represents Tabanuco forest, blue represents Polo Colorado forest, and red represents Elfin forest. So here, total abundance changes in a fashion so that the elevational decline in species richness, I'm sorry, the elevational decline in total abundance depends upon transect. It's steeper in one transect than another, but it never intersects. And this is true even for the other two species that showed this same result. Generally, the lines were parallel. There was always more abundance in the palm forest than in the Tabanuco forest, but they were always declining with increasing elevation, except for in one species. So, from the population level analysis, we've been able to corroborate that all species but one decrease in abundance with increasing elevation. Most species enjoy higher abundance in palm than in non-palm forest. And for most species, elevational trends in uh, abundance parallel or in parallel between mixed and palm forest transects and the total abundance represents the same thing. So this is probably one of the few cases in my life where almost every species that I looked at showed this the same general pattern and it makes you feel like the, the process that you're trying to capture is one that has some reality to it uh, rather than every species does its own thing and then you try to explain with just those stories how it is that they all do it their own particular way. But, but this is going to be very important, especially this last point when I come to talk about both community level variation with elevation and meta-community differences between palm and mixed forest transects. So the next part of my talk will focus on community level attributes of, of gastropod assemblages. And I'm basically going to be talking about biodiversity. The most commonly studied aspect of biodiversity is species richness. Of course, you all know that there are many other aspects of it. And all of them try to capture the shape of the species abundance distribution. So what I've done here, it really is hard to do both of these at the same time. Uh, what I've done here is showed you a hypothetical species abundance distributions that we always set up with in rank order. So the most abundant species is on the left and they get progressively less abundant or in relative abundance as you go up in rank. And each of these indices of biodiversity tell us something about this species abundance distribution. So for example, richness tells us about what's the length of the tails as we go out. It's simply the number of species that define the species abundance distribution. Dominance simply measures the height of the species that has the highest rank, the, most dom the species with highest abundance. That's its relative proportion. So dominance is a, is a measure of the extent to which a single species dominates, hence the name dominance, dominates a particular community. Evenness represents the extent to which all of the species in the community have the same proportional abundance, the extent to which the distribution is flat versus skewed one way or another. Uh, diversity, as you all know, is a composite of uh, both richness and evenness. And rarity, uh, at least in the case that I'm talking about here, measures the number of species whose relative abundance is less than that you'd expect due to chance alone. So if there's S species in a community by chance alone, each species ought to have 1 over S as their proportional abundance. Those species with less than 1 over S as their proportional abundance are rare. Uh, and so in this particular diagram, uh, 1 over S is represented by the yellow lines, and you can see that there's two, four, six, seven species that were rare. So the point of all this is all these indices do is describe the species abundance distribution to a greater or lesser extent and try to give us a handle on how it is that diversity, biodiversity from a taxonomic perspective, varies along the elevational gradient. So the organization of this slide is essentially the same as the previous one, right? We still have uh, transect, elevation, and the interaction between those two as the categorical factors of interest. And um, negative signs after an element of biodiversity tells you the direction of change with increasing elevation. So notice that richness, diversity, and rarity all decline as we go up the mountain. Notice that each of the, that's a, that's a Pittsburgh term, mountain. That's what everybody else says is mountain. But, um, so any, any index of diversity that's sensitive to richness, which is richness in its own right, 
diversity because it's a measure of both, and rarity, which is a measure of richness, decline as you go up in elevation, whereas evenness and dominance, which are sensitive to the relative abundances of, of individuals, change in the opposite direction. Notice that there are no interactive effects, so whatever effects we have are consistent. If there's a transect effect, it happens at all elevations. If there's an elevation effect, it happens on both transects. And what you'll notice is that all elements of biodiversity respond to elevation in significant ways. There are clearly strong gradients in biodiversity, and that there's transect effects, but again, the transect effects only appear for those elements of biodiversity that are sensitive to species richness. All the ones in red uh, show similar patterns in terms of a decrease in whatever the magnitude is of the metric of interest with increasing elevation. So in this particular case, I'm going to show you the, the diagrammatic representation of, of these particular uh, phenomena. So again, the organization is the same. Dashed lines and open symbols represent palm forest assemblages. Solid lines and filled symbols represent transects. The transect that is the mixed forest transect. Uh, green, blue, and red represent Tabanuco, Palo Colorado, and Elfin Forest, uh, uh, respectively. And what you can see, and the statistical results are shown on the top, so there was no significant interaction. There's significant differences between the transect. There's, this, there's significant declines along both transects with increasing elevation. And these are the best fit straight lines through the data, but the statistics tells us that those are parallel. So we have the, the, the rates of decrease in species richness with elevation are in parallel along the two transects. You start out with more species in palm forest than in mixed forest, and you go down with that. Uh, the same is true for rarity. The number of species whose relative abundance is less than 1 over s. So the appearance of perhaps non-parallel lines is just an artifact of what the best fit straight lines are through the data. But statistically, they're indistinguishable from each other. When we look at diversity, uh, now we have no interaction again. We have palm forest with higher diversity than does a mixed forest transect, and it declines with increasing elevation. So that's simply illustrating the consistent effects of transect and elevation on all richness-sensitive metrics of biodiversity. Now if we move on to the metrics of biodiversity that include in them responses to relative abundance, we get a somewhat different relationship. Notice that in this particular case, uh, both dominance and evenness go up. And, and I'm going to try to remember to come back to that because that doesn't seem logical at first glance, but it's actually highly logical with a little bit of thought. Uh, and what happens, there, uh, those two lines are coincident, is what that statistics is telling us. There are no differences between the transects, each of them responding in the same way to elevation. Any differences you see between that solid straight line and that dashed straight line are just due to chance, just like if you were randomly sampling from the same universe. So usually one thinks of the dominance as sort of the opposite of a, a diversity index, and you think of evenness as the opposite of a diversity index as well. So it may seem uh, anti-intuitive that dominance and evenness would change in the same direction along an elevational gradient. But what's happening here, I might be able to explain this, with this figure is what's happening is you lose species, you're losing rare species. And if we only lost those rare species and recalculated the relative abundance of those that remain, the relative abundance of the most dominant species would go up. Or if you took those rare species and just redistributed individuals at random among those remaining species, if at least one individual <laughs> went to the most dominant species, dominance would go up. So evenness in this case is measuring uh, what it's supposed to be measuring, and so is dominance, except what's happening is that you, I'll call it the reallocation of individuals among uh, non-rare species is, is preferentially either happening to the most dominant species, or is, and only one has to go there for its relative abundance to go up compared to all of the rest. So people sometimes think that evenness and dominance are kind of measuring the same thing, but they're really not because dominance is only sensitive to the most abundant, whereas evenness is sensitive to all the species that are there. And as soon as you lose rare species, evenness goes up, right? But you lose rare species, dominance doesn't necessarily go up. It's more likely to increase unless there's some disproportionate addition of individuals to all the other intermediately dominant species compared to the most abundant. So they're really not antithetical at all. They're really, it's just the, the mechanism whereby individuals are reallocated or redistributed at different elevations. So as you recall, um, we had very strong variation 
elevational variation in total abundance, and the patterns that we observe for richness, diversity, and rarity parallel those that we obtained for total abundance. And so I was interested in the question as well, wouldn't it be cool if some of the variation that we were seeing in these biodiversity metrics were simply a consequence of changes in total number of individuals, a topic that Gary kind of introduced when he talked about the more individuals hypothesis or random placement hypothesis or, or, or whatever. Uh, and so I wanted to explore that, and, and we did it in a variety of ways, some by simulation approaches, some by um, covariance approaches. I'm going to talk about the covariance approach because it's the easiest one to present to a, a large class like this without having to go into all the details about simulation analyses. But you could take either approach to try to understand the effects of total number of individuals on aspects of biodiversity. So essentially what I did is re-ran all the, the analyses I talked about on each of the five metrics of biodiversity, but now I added another covariate, which was total abundance, the total number of individuals in a particular plot, giving rise to this diagram. Uh, and again, it's a little complicated, but I'll take a minute to explain it. It's, and you already kind of had a background. Uh, I've underlined any significance from the previous analysis before we had the covariate of, of, of abundance in there. So if we go across the first line, richness, uh, when we didn't have the covariate, we got a transect effect, it's underlined, we had an elevation effect. When I added a covariance for abundance, it went away. Richness doesn't change between transects and richness doesn't change with elevation any more than you'd expect given variation in total abundance. And so that's why it's also red. That's why abundance is in red. Abundance had a significant effect on richness, and it responded in this way. So that biodiversity now was not responding to elevation in transect above and beyond the way in which total abundance was responding to transect. And this particular pattern was recapitulated by diversity and rarity, the three metrics that have a strong species richness component in it. Uh, even this showed a uh, retained an elevational response, as did dominance, uh, but there were no transect effects any longer. Controlling for abundance gets rid of transect effects. So, in summary, from the community perspective, all components of biodiversity consistently varied with elevation. Uh, richness sensitive components differed between transects. Elevation and transect effects on richness sensitive components seem to be related to variation in total abundance. And so abundance is playing a, a big role in not only helping us understand, obviously, how populations change, because that's how you're measuring abundance, but also in trying to understand how these, bio, these metrics of biodiversity are changing. So it's a simple story again. The changes that we see in these five metrics of biodiversity are more or less accounted for by variation in total abundance along an elevational transect and between transects. So it was a very powerful way of sort of understanding mechanisms of biodiversity dynamics in space. So now I'm going to shift gears for a moment and talk about meta-communities, which to me is paralleling something that Bruce talked about when he talked about meta-ecosystems. Meta well, in a sense, a meta-community is just the biological community that occupies the ecosystems that are connected to each other by the dispersal of individuals or by the dispersal of nutrients and energy uh, among them. Uh, more formally, uh, meta-community ecology, I, I guess it's existed for a long time, uh, in fact, when I look back at that, when I went to work in Brazil and wanted to look at elevational gradients, I was moved by the work of Turborg, who was trying to understand sort of Clemencian-like communities and com contrasting them with Gleasonian kinds of communities, trying to understand how ecotones change along those gradients. Uh, the historical debate between Clements and, and um, Gleason about the structure of communities, whether they're individualistic responses by species to gradients or species in tandem are responding as, as superorganisms and therefore evincing compartments. So I'm going to use the term Clementsian in a way that's slightly different from the way people talk about Clementsian in general. When I say something will have a Clementsian structure, it means it exhibits distinctive compartments and doesn't say anything about the mechanism that gives rise to it per se. No superorganism, no special effects going on by superorganisms along the screen. It's simply saying that you have distinctive compartments that are distinguishable by other such compartments because of compositional unity and differences between those elements of compositional unity. But the meta-community perspective is one that moves our focus away from what's happening within particular communities to say what's happening to the suite of communities because they're communicating with each other. How are they communicating to each other by the movement of individuals? Well, what individuals are moving? Well, it depends on the species. 
And so what I've tried to show here are three sites represented by the black circles. Uh, each site contains some number of individuals represented by the smaller circles. The species identity of those circles are represented by colors. The movement of individuals from one site to another uh, is the glue that holds the meta-community together. And the questions that I'll focus on is what is the structure of this meta-community? As a consequence of the glue, as a consequence of individuals moving among those sites, what's the emergent property of the suite of sites along the transect? And so, in some regards, we can think of this as sort of a mesoecological approach to trying to understand uh, variation in time and space. So, the approach gets a little complicated, but I'll try to sort of simplify it in a way that I hope is understandable. So, really, you, you, the, the nice thing about the meta community approach that I'll talk about here is that all you need is presence absence data zeros and ones. And for each site along the gradient, you characterize whether each of the possible species that occur there is present one or absent zero. So, it's, so you simply have this, uh, a species site matrix where species that are present are one, species that are absent are zeros. And of course, the order of species might be alphabetical, it might be taxonomic, depending on how you choose to array them along the, the, the x-axis. And the sites may be arranged in some sensical way, but they may not as well. But this rep basically represents a, um, an untransformed matrix. And what we, in terms of understanding meta-community organization, we want to transform that matrix so that sites with similar species compositions are adjacent to each other, and species with similar spatial distributions are adjacent to each other. So, you, you, and one of the ways you can do that, one of the better ways to do it, if that is exactly what your intention is, is to do reciprocal averaging because it optimizes that, that those two constraints putting sites next to each other that share species compositions and putting species close to each other that share site distributions. And so, for example, I could take a distribution like this, which is unordered, transform it so that now the site, the, the ordering of the sites represent a gradient based upon their species composition. And the ordering of species represents a gradient based upon their occurrences in space. And this transform matrix that derives from reciprocal averaging becomes the, the fodder for all the meta community analyses that I'll talk about uh, hereafter. Once we've transformed uh, a presence absence matrix into one via reciprocal averaging, uh, we use three elements of meta community structure to try to characterize different patterns in that emergent uh, network of sites. Uh, we look at coherence, species turnover, and boundary clumping. Uh, coherence basically derives from the concept of the Gaussian niche. If a species is responding to a gradient, and it can exist, for example, at one degrees, and it can exist at two degrees, you expect that it will exist at one and a half degrees, right? If it doesn't occur there, it's, it, it might be a sampling problem. But you expect species distributions to be continuous along that axis of abiotic space. If they are responding to that gradient, right? So if a species is really spawning to a gradient, then it should always be, it should look more like here, where you have three adjacent presences, than here where you have a bunch of holes in the distribution, the zeros are holes. So when you measure coherence, you actually count the number of holes that are surrounded by ones, and you do it for all the species. Because the assumption here is not just that a species responds to a gradient, it's that all species in the meta community are responding to the same environmental gradient. And so the number of holes that you get in the distribution is a measure of the extent to which all the species are responding to the same environmental gradient. And that's a measure of coherence. And coherence is, um, well, is telling you that you've identified a gradient, at least a latent environmental gradient, to which species are responding to some extent. Then the other two attributes of uh, meta community organization that we look at is species turnover and boundary clumping. Uh, species turnover is measured by the extent to which uh, where one species ends its distribution, another one begins it, turnover. And so it looks at all possible pairs of species and counts the number of times, let's say, species A is replaced by species B versus situations where uh, species A is never replaced by anything. <laughs> and, uh, and counting the number, of all, the, the number of empirical turnovers between possible pairs of species is then compared to a distribution of such effects where you, you're randomizing your presence absence matrix um, so that species richness of sites remains constant, but the identity of species is equal probable. 
Uh, and the extent to which then your observed metric of turnover deviates from that randomly generated distribution of turnovers is a measurement of the extent to which you have positive turnover or negative turnover. Similarly, boundary clumping is a measure of the extent to which species co-occur and form compartments. So on the left, I have a hypothetical example where uh, we have uh, four species, two of them only existed sites A and B, a different two only existed sites C and D, distinct compartments versus a situation like this where you don't really get compositional unity in space that's easily discernible in terms of compartments. Uh, and the way in which you, you, you measure boundary clumping is to actually at each, in my case, elevation, count the number of range termini that occur at a particular elevation, and then evaluate if that distribution is as a flat distribution, or in fact, is there a hyper concentration of boundary, um, yeah, boundaries in particular elevational uh, strata suggesting turnover between communities, compartments. And we compare that to a randomized distribution of species where we maintain their, uh, their size, that is the number of elevational strata with, within which they occur, but we randomize at what elevations they occur. And so we compare then the empirical measurement of boundary clumping to a randomized construction of boundary clumping, but where we've retained species elevational ranges to be fixed and species specific. So, Based upon that information from the uh, transformed species abundance distribution matrix, uh, we can distinguish among six patterns of meta-community organization, some of which you've heard in different contexts, perhaps from what I'll talk about today, and I've already intimated that with respect to what the Clementsian distribution will be. So I, I've identified the six patterns, and I'll have a little cartoon that imperfectly, but hopefully from a gut level, communicates what such a pattern might look like, and I'll try to point you toward the salient features of that pattern so that you have a well, at least a general understanding of what I'm talking about. So, in a random distribution, each species has a lot of holes in its distribution. <laughs> They're not responding to that environmental gradient. No, they're not responding to the same environmental gradient. So you notice that there's a lot of holes in species distributions. So that's the point that I'm trying to get here. If you looked at the distribution of black spots, they'd be at random with respect to the whole checkerboard that's out there. Uh, Checkerboards were sort of popularized by study, other studies in the Caribbean, especially that have looked at lizard communities. And checkerboards were situations where you had, let's say, pairs of species that alternated in what island they were found on. A on island one, B on island two, A on island three, B on island four, whatever the numbers are. So there was this alternation of things. Well, checkerboard patterns from a meta-community perspective are a little different than that because they assume that pairs of species do show this alternating pattern but the pattern that any one species shows is independent of the pattern that other species show. So here I've tried to show it so that the first two species show a clear checkerboard from the classical definition. So does the next two species. So does the next two species. But notice the patterns that they show are different. So species still show this alternation of presence and absence at particular sites, but the way in which they do that is species specific and independent of each other. And that's a measure of the extent to which something is a checkerboard from a meta-community perspective. So it's kind of dangerous to think of this in the limited sense of the way uh, herpetologists or ornithologists use it when they describe stuff in the Caribbean a long time ago. Nested subsets were popularized, especially because of the ostensible role they might play in making conservation decisions of, and about species loss characteristics and whether uh, one big reserve or a whole bunch of little reserves was the best conservation strategy for maximizing biodiversity. Uh, but the, the process was very simple. That is, if you arrange species from most species-rich sites to least species-rich site, uh, you, had a, you had a subsetting occurring where uh, species-poor sites are perfect subsets of the next most species-rich site. So they form nested subsets. This is a perfectly nested circumstance. So uh, one consequence of that is if you, find, if you go to the most species-poor site, whatever species you find there should be found at any site, regardless of how many species that are there and that you should only really be finding unique species in the most species-rich sites because, by definition, that's the only place that they can occur. Uh, Clementsian distributions I've already kind of talked about. That's distinctive compartments. You, so you see two compartments here. Uh, all three of these sites are very similar compositionally. All two of these sites are very similar compositionally in terms of the species they, that occur there. So by compositional unity, you'd say, oh, there's the left-hand community. And on the right, there'd be a separate community for it based upon species uh, presences. In a Gleasonian community, species are, this is a point where people often get confused, 
In a Gleasonian pattern, species are responding to the environmental gradient and they're doing so in an idiosyncratic fashion, that is, independently of each other. So notice that there's no holes in any of these species distributions, but they're coming and going at random with respect to each other. At least that's what the cartoon ostensibly hopes to communicate to you. And finally, uh, evenly spaced communities ostensibly arise when there's severe competition among suites of species, so that you get very even species distributions and then forming almost perfect uh, stair steps. Uh, this was a, a pattern that was promoted by Tillman in some of his plant work, and this would be example, for example, where every species but one has exactly the same uh, elevational distribution, and, um, uh, and, and they're varying in a staggered fashion from each other. And so nicely, these three elements of meta-community uh, structure can be superimposed on a decision tree so that if you do analyses with respect to coherence, species turnover, and boundary clumping, you can come up with a categorization of the meta-community based upon those characteristics. And um, I won't go into the various uh, quasi-structures that can also be identified, but, uh, but, but we will essentially use this paradigm to try to classify the two com meta-communities along the elevational gradient. Uh, and this approach has some strengths associated with it. For example, previous approaches uh, essentially took a single canonical structure versus random structure. So for example, classical studies of uh, nestedness say you're nested or you're not nested. It, so you could be, have a Clemensian structure, you could have an even structure, you could have a, uh, a Gleasonian structure, you could have whatever. All of those non-nested structures were all part of what was not significant in that outcome, because you only had two alternatives, A or B. And anything that wasn't A was B. So here we have multiple competing hypotheses that we can distinguish by a suite of uh, three different metrics, and so it's a more powerful approach to distinguish among competing hypotheses about community organization. And the other thing is that classical approaches to nestedness, a priori identify a, the gradient of interest to be species richness, and it was species richness that was used to ordinate sites, and then they were evaluated for their nestedness once they have been ordinated with respect to species richness, whereas this approach allows species composition to ordinate the community rather than species richness to do so. Uh, so the current approach allows all six canonical structures to be evaluated, and you can detect structures along spatial gradients, environmental gradients, or unknown gradients because um, the factor type analysis that we're doing is, is examining a latent environmental gradient. And then you can see how that latent environmental gradient might be correlated with particular uh, biotic or abiotic gradients of interest. So remembering the story is we're trying to look at how animal assemblages are responding to abiotic characteristics or climatic versus those associated with uh, vegetation or the flora. So a very naive assumption perhaps was that, okay, they're both responding to abiotic variation along with elevation. But there's something different that's happening along the mixed forest transect. There are three distinct community types of plants. And if the animals are responding to those distinct communities of plants, you might expect a more Clemensian distribution in the mixed forest transect based upon the trees and a more Gleasonian distribution based upon their distributions along the palm forest transect. And indeed, that's what you get. Uh, if you uh, ordinate species, Notice that the, if you look at the primary axis of ordination, that determines the, the rank order of elevational sites. And then if you plot the distribution of species, you do the meta-community analysis, uh, you refer back to the decision tree, and you get that the mixed forest transect is Clemensian, the palm forest transect is quasi-Gleasonian. Uh, interestingly, the latent environmental gradient associated with the mixed forest transect is correlated with elevation. So elevation is a surrogate for that abiotic gradient. That's also true in the palm forest, but the palm forest and the mixed forest transects themselves are not correlated with each other. So each are showing some elevation-induced variation, but the things that elevation is inducing along the two transects are somewhat different. In fact, they're uncorrelated with each other. Um, very quickly, as you might say, well, this analysis is, is pretty basic. It, it only requires presence or absence. What would happen if you actually used abundance of species and tried to ordinate those communities? Would that give you a real different examination? Because remember, you only have to have one individual at a site for it to be present. And so if you have one individual there or a million individuals there, it's the same in a presence-absence matrix, but it might be might, much different in an abundance 
uh, matrix. And so we did that analysis. I'll just quickly show you that uh, we did non-metric multi-metric non multi-dimensional scaling based upon the abundances of the species versus the um, reciprocal averaging approach. And the main thing is the species score, I'm sorry, the site scores on dimension one of the incidence-based approach highly correlated with the scores from uh, uh, the mixed force approach. And notice that the, the, the actual forests come out more apparently when you weight it by abundance than with just presence. The same is true when you look at palm forest. In fact, interestingly, the three forest types are more distinct in the palm forest than they were in the, um, the mixed forest transects based upon snails, not based upon trees. Um, so how can we reconcile these two, th this phenomenon that here we have two transects, you know, there are, there are, I could throw a ball from one transect to the next. Snails aren't super vagile, but they, they can cover that distance in a couple days pretty easily. There's palm forests interspersed throughout mixed forest. And by the way, the dominant tree species, Prestoea montana, it's not unique to palm forest. It's just most abundant there. Prestoea is all through that forest. It's in mixed forest transects as well. So my hypothesis for, for that is as follows. Let's, these two, car, these two cartoons hopefully <laughs> illustrate the process. I've tried to draw a, a cartoon here of uh, species distributions represented by vertical um, bars. The colors green and, I'm sorry, the colors blue and red represent my two compartments. There was one species, the one in green, that was everywhere. But you'd look at this and say, yeah, there's a blue community, there's a red community. Any fool can see that. We don't need fancy statistics. Well, how is it that 100 meters away, we get a distribution that looks way different than that? And my hypothesis is this. Remember that abundance played a really important role in distinguishing palm forest from mixed forest, as well as the elevational variation and that all species enjoy higher, higher densities at lower elevations. So my hypothesis is that whatever the conditions are that limit species distributions in the mixed forest, in this diagram are represented by the solid colors. But now all those previously unacceptable positions in environmental space have higher production associated with them, more individuals associated with them. As a consequence, the cost of doing business in a marginal habitat, let's say here or here or here or here or here, is offset by the higher production in those sites in palm forest than in the, along the mixed forest transect. And if this is true, and species respond idiosyncratically to that added productivity, that is, some increase a little, some increase a lot, uh, some do it only in one direction, some do it in two directions. So if species are expanding the range up and down based upon the reduced cost of living in palm forest versus Tabanuco, Polo, Colorado, or dwarf forest, then we would get a pattern that was more Gleasonian-like. And in fact, that's what happens. Over half of the species in palm forest have broader spatial distributions in palm forest than they do in, um, along the mixed forest transect statistically higher abundances, and I think there's four or five more species that empirically have higher abundances, but we statistically can't detect it. So the point here is that uh, the mixed forest transect was Clemencian, the palm forest transect was Gleasonian, and that those distinctive structures may in fact arise as a consequence of the same factor that's affecting variation in, in metrics of biodiversity, differences between sites and their uh, production and productivity. In fact, if you go back and look at the Lukio experimental force, it's well known that primary productivity decreases with increasing elevation, that the most productive sites at any elevation are palm forest sites. If you look at litter baskets along that elevational gradient, the, the quantity of litter in palm forest is always higher than the litter quantity in a paired mixed forest scenario. And also, the concentration of calcium, a very important nutrient for the metabolism or the production of snails, is also higher in palm forest than it is in mixed forest. So it seems like uh, we can take the overarching question and reformat it based upon the information that we have, is that both elevational and adaptive, that is palm forest versus mixed forest transects, uh, affect productivity. Productivity affects species abundances. Species abundances affect community characteristics along the elevational gradient as, as well as between transects. These same factors, species abundances, are affecting ostensibly uh, meta-community organization in a consistent fashion as well. And so if we go back to the more individuals hypothesis that suggests, or the species energy hypothesis that suggests the more energy or the more individuals you have, the more likely it is you are to include rare species, it can account for both uh, community variation and meta-community variation in the Lukiu experimental forest.
and um, future work there will uh, actually explore not only how the taxonomic dimension of biodiversity varies with elevation, but how uh, functional and phylogenetic dimensions of biodiversity vary as well. And we're also trying to decompose all three of those dimensions into their alpha, beta, and gamma components uh, to try to understand these patterns. And unfortunately, the uh, Puerto Rican gradient is relatively small compared to like the Andes. So we also are lucky that we have data on three different taxa of birds, bats, and rats. And we're exploring these same general kinds of questions about uh, taxonomic, functional, and phylogenetic diversity, how it varies along the elevational gradient, how much phylogenetic or taxa, um, functional biodiversity is a consequence of variation in species richness, and what the implications of that are to meta community organization. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Willig. We have time for one question, please. In your elevational gradients, you saw a linear relationship uh, in diversity, richness, and uh, rarity. But it looked like your relationship was curvilinear at between 800 and 1,000. And, and it almost went up a little bit to 1,000. Is that true? Um, statistically, it's not true. Okay. Empirically, you're right. The, the trend looks like that. We've actually done uh, orthogonal, po orthogonal polynomial regression. And what I plotted were the means, not the, the 10 plots themselves. So there's a lot of spread among those means. That means that slight bip up that you've seen is the mean going up, but there's a broad range of taxa there. But there's no evidence for, a, for an independent uh, quadratic or nonlinear effect, uh, although there may, in fact, be one. We haven't been able to detect it with the sample sizes that we have, but sharp eye. <laughs> I have more questions for we'll do that in the panel discussion. All right, now we have uh, our next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>